All right, we are live. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And today I'm continuing these character studies. Uh, and uh, we've already done quite a few of them. And now we've worked our way chronologically up to this character known as Jacob. And uh, we're going to try to look at Jacob and Esau together since they're twins more at the same time. And they're so connected to each other uh, in the scriptures. Um, so that's what we're going to do today. If you haven't seen the previous uh, study character studies, they're already uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, under the playlist title, um, Character Studies. And uh, with me right now is uh, Brother Sam. Brother Sam, why don't you say hi to everybody? Hello, everybody. God bless you. Yeah, well, I hope you'll subscribe to Brother uh, Sam's uh, YouTube channel or channels. Do you have a bunch of them up now? Because you just told me that you've got them all reinstated, or you've got reinstated. How, how do you want them to subscribe to you, Brother? Oh, um, anyone can go to uh, my channel by typing thickshades.com or uh, youtube.com slash thickshades. Uh, you'll get to my channel. And, uh, you know, and there you, uh, you'll be able to see a lot of controversial things. Uh, but bottom line, uh, Christ saves. Believe on Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Okay. All right. Thank you for joining me today, brother. Oh, let's just get started here. We're going to look at all the scriptures that have the name Jacob in it and try to learn about this character uh, that is such a significant character in the scriptures. Uh, so... Let me go first to uh, the first occurrence uh, is uh, Genesis twenty-five twenty-six. It says, "And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold es on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. Uh, and Isaac was threescore uh, years old when uh, she bare them. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them." Okay, well, Isaac's not a she, so that must be talking about his wife that bare them. Uh, that would be Rebecca. Uh, now, talk a little bit about Jacob in the last study that I did on Isaac. Uh, I couldn't help but uh, talk about Jacob to a certain extent. But, brother, first, um, we notice here that they are twins, and uh, Esau uh, is the twin that comes out first. And Jacob is holding on to Esau's heel as he's coming out. Uh, so, what do you get from this this verse here? What anything significant? Well, uh, you know, it's, it is interesting. Uh, even before they were born, they were struggling together in the womb of uh, of, of their mother, uh, and uh, that kind of foreshadows uh, what what. Uh, what to be happen, and uh, you know later what, whatever conflict they may have. So, uh, I mean, when it is also interesting that uh, <laughs> Jacob was holding uh, Asus heel, <laughs> and, and it's, it's kind of shows you know his characteristic, you know his tenacity, so to say. <laughs> you know, it's comical in a way a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, it's a uh, it's it's a, a struggle from right from the moment of birth between between them. Uh, first, it seems like there's a struggle to get out first because uh, I guess in many cultures, uh, but particularly we know that in um, uh, Israel, Judaism, the, 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 there's a great significance of being the firstborn. Now, if you're if you're not twins, it's really easy to identify the firstborn, you know, but if you're twins, uh, you know, you're coming out just like moments apart from each other. So, but even, even in that tiny diff time differential, coming out first has a huge advantage, being the firstborn. Uh, do, you, do you have anything to say about the advantage of being firstborn? Well, I am uh, also a firstborn. Uh, there are certain advantages but also there are certain you know responsibilities and disadvantages as well. 
Um, you know, throughout the, their story, Jacob and Esau, um, it seems like uh, Esau, he, he kind of forsakes his, uh, his birthright, so to say. And that kind of shows his irresponsibility as, as a firstborn. And, um, you know, it is true that you get a lot of bad rap when you're a firstborn and you have to be responsible for your brothers and sisters. And if, even if your brothers did something wrong, you know, you, you got to take the blame for that and all, and all that. But uh, maybe, maybe Asu, the way he is, uh, you know, they, they, they grew up very differently, you know. Uh, Jacob was uh, calm and quiet, more, more or less, and Asu was like a, a hunter. So that right there tells very uh, different characteristics of the two. Um, but uh, one thing for sure is it's not what they do outwardly, but inwardly what they are... Uh, what they are, the thing that's more important, and throughout the chapter, probably, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully we'll be able to explore that, you know, what just what those are. Yeah, well, you you talked about the the responsibilities being firstborn, but it's it's really the um, the um, advantage of being firstborn. It seems to me that, that there's a struggle here. Um, I don't know if it's from birth that uh, somehow um, this has any significance in grabbing this heel and trying, trying to get out. But some people would think that there's a um, Jacob uh, is trying to get out because this firstborn is so valuable. Uh, Jesus Christ is referred to as the firstborn and uh, some of the, uh, the cults who don't uh, believe in the deity of Christ they believe that is a designation showing that he was created. He was first born, the first thing that God created, the first being. Uh, but we know that Jesus Christ is eternal. He does not have a beginning to an end. He's fully God Almighty. Uh, and yet he's called first born. And the, 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 the significance of that is that first born can also be um, uh, interchanged with the word Preeminent, preeminent. When you're preeminent, that means that you are above all the others. You're above it. Jesus is firstborn over all creation. He has preeminence over all the creation. Uh, uh, Jacob, I mean, he wanted to be firstborn because uh, the firstborn in the family has preeminence. He has the bulk of the inheritance. Now, I don't know how that breaks down if it's like, 90% he gets or 60% or something, but he has a larger share of the inheritance than, than any of the other uh, that are born. Uh, and, and he also, I think, has some kind of authority, authority over the other firstborn. Yeah, exactly. And also, you know, it's interesting to observe, uh, you know, Jacob holding onto uh, Ace's hill and uh, that kind of significant, significant he qualifies the uh, Israel uh, holding the heel of um, you know Arab countries, for example. Uh, they kind of always those Arab um, Muslims, so to say, uh, they kind of consider Israel as uh, hindrance, more or less. Uh, and it's it's interesting. We kind of see the res resemblance between uh, between their relationship and the relationship between Israel and other Arab countries. Yeah, um, I, I've gone over this uh, quite thoroughly in, in the previous studies when we were talking about Abraham and Isaac, and um, how Isaac was not the firstborn either. Uh, the firstborn from Abraham was Ishmael. Right. Uh, so, you know, but he was not the one that God planned. He's the one that, that Abraham and uh, his wife Sarah uh, conspired to go against the will of God and have a child with a with a handmaid, and, and which was not God's plan at all. But so God did not honor that Ishmael was firstborn. But the Arab countries, particularly the Muslims of the world, they uh, they are descendants of Ishmael, 
and they are also descendants of Esau. So you've got uh, Isaac, Isaac uh, on one side, and you got Ishmael on the other. On Isaac's side, you have the, the Jewish nation and his descendants, and Ishmael, you have the Arab and Muslim nations. And then you also have the same thing happening here, right here with Jacob and Esau. And we'll find that Jacob, uh, the, the prophecy say that uh, the Messiah will come from the descendants of the family line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, David. These are all listed in prophecies as um, uh, fathers of Jesus, in terms of grandfather. So, so you've got Jacob and Esau. You got Jacob. You've got the Jewish and Jesus coming from him, and then you got Esau, and he went off and became another great, great nation of the Edomites, and uh, they, uh, from his descendants, you get these Arab countries and the Muslims again. So it's interesting how these uh, brothers and half brothers, uh, you know, the world today is divided, and it was it's all caused by this these birth things that happened with uh, Isaac and Ishmael and Jacob and Esau. Right, and uh, given that, uh, we can expect the uh, reconciliation among them as well later on. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's look at this next uh, verse that comes up here. Uh, it's um. Uh, let's see, Genesis twenty five twenty seven. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. Uh, I'll read 28 also. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Uh, so, uh, first of all, there's two things here. They're totally different types of people, and then also uh, their favorites uh, uh, of the parents. What do you have to say about that? Well, I tell you one thing. Um, one of my favorite, actually, the favorite meat for me is venison. I mean, uh, I tried all kind of meat, but when I tried venison, I'm like, wow, <laughs> <laughs> wow. So I can see, you know, why <laughs> why he was loved. <laughs> and obviously, uh, since Jacob dwelt in, in tents. Probably helping out his mom, um, doing you know lifting heavy things, you know, doing you know chores and uh, and things like that. And I'm sure um, you know Rebecca loved Jacob, so I can see you know I can see why they love each different sons. So um, well, venison is good. <laughs> even, though, even though you love venison so much, uh, if you had two sons. And one of them could prepare venison for you, great, expertly. Uh, I don't think that you're going to love him more and prefer him over the other son for that fact alone, are you? Well, you know, during this time, it was, it's like a hunter, more or less, is it, more uh, valued in a way because they provide you, especially when you provide when you're provided with venison. You know, I'll probably favor favor him as well. <laughs> you know. Isaac did well. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, I have, uh, there, there are five siblings in my family. And uh, my mother always, always claimed that she loved us all equally. And, and uh, you know, some of the siblings argued and thought that she did love some more than others. But she said, no, no, I love all my children. And uh, uh, I think a lot of parents like to say that they love, but but um, they may love them equally, but they love them in different ways. And oh, yeah. uh, they have their favorites, you know. Yeah. Even my kitten uh, just had six kittens, and among them, I have my favorite. Uh, so I mean, I I I like them all, but. Uh, I do have favorites, and even my kids. I I only have two kids, and frankly, I I do have my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> you better be careful. Don't say publicly. Keep them guessing so they don't know which one's your favorite. <laughs> oh man! Uh, but then also, you pointed out the distinction, that, and it says here that uh, uh, 
Uh, Esau was a very good hunter and provided venison. And it says that uh, Jacob was a plain man, just dwelled in the tent. He didn't seem to have anything particular that was exciting or appealing about him. But, but the mother preferred Jacob and the father preferred Esau. Right. Now, some people make a big deal about that, uh, uh, that because uh, it says that Jacob loved Esau uh, or something that uh, if you love one, it doesn't mean you hate the other. It just means that uh, you have a, a special kind of love for the one, and you love the other as well. Imagine it's right. just it's, not a, it, it's a different kind of love. You're not as, as uh, you don't have as much in common. Maybe maybe uh, uh, Jacob had. I mean Isaac had more in common with with uh, Esau because of the hunting, and maybe he liked to do that too. I don't know. Right. I mean, you know, I mean Isaac. Uh, I'm sure he he he, he liked to. Uh, to hunt as well, and at his old age, probably it's, it's harder for him to hunt and um, and provide for the family. But Asu, he he's constantly providing with good meat. Uh, I mean, I tell you, I mean, I had a whole bunch of rabbits, you know, attacking my garden, and I do all kind of stuff. I can never catch one, <laughs> even a rabbit. But this guy is going out there and getting venison for his dad. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, surely he'll, he'll I'm sure Isaac loved uh, Jacob as well. Uh, as you said, you know, having favor over someone doesn't mean that you you, you hate them or, or don't love them, you know. You just have, have a little more, you know, favoritism for a certain, certain person yeah. or, or, or guy. Yeah. yeah, well, it's clear here that there is some favoritism, and then a lot of people would be very judgmental and saying, well, it's wrong, you shouldn't have favoritism, but you're saying you're saying that you can understand this, that uh, it's natural for us to have favorites. Yeah, I'm sure, and even Christ, I think, you know, he kind of mentioned, uh, and, and he did have his favorite disciples as well, namely John, <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, that's true, true, that's a good example. Okay, let's go to the, um, 29 says, And Jacob sawed porridge, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was he called Edom. Uh, I don't know what Edom means, but uh, uh, maybe it means faint, or uh, maybe it means pottage. I don't know. Do you have any idea what Edom, Edom means? Um, I guess it means um, tired, faint. <laughs> that's what the, that's what the, what, it, what it says here. Uh, but the, the 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 name Edom in, in a Hebrew baby name, uh, meaning uh, the uh, meaning red. You know, probably uh, Esau, Esau had red hair, red skin, or, or whatever. But it means red, Edom. Yeah, I think that is getting red earth uh, of the in the past. I think. Uh, let me see. Yeah, I, I think Esau means red. Uh, uh, maybe Edom means red. I don't know which is which. Right. Edom means red, right? If you can find that one. Right um, okay, but here's the interesting part. It says, and uh, so. Uh, Jacob came and he was really hungry and faint. And Esau had, I mean, uh, Esau was really hungry. Jacob had some food and Esau asked him for some. But Jacob, uh, he would not just give his brother the food, it was a gift, share it with him. He says in verse 31, and Jacob said, uh, and Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Jacob said, Swear to me this day, and he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob he saw bread and pottage with lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way, and thus he saw despised his birthright. Wow. <laughs> yeah. He considered his birthright as nothing to the point that he would despise it. So, obviously, and Jack, Jacob knew that. Jacob, I mean, throughout, uh, probably as they were growing up, uh, maybe they had a conversation, uh, and Jacob took that opportunity uh, 
and Jacob was wise enough what what this birthright means. And but um, obviously, you know, Esau, he he didn't know it, or he knew it but he despised it. So either way, it's not good. <laughs> yeah. Now I do know that the name Jacob uh, translates to um, to planter or schemer or trickster. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, we're gonna. There's another story coming up that will make us understand this idea of schemer and how he schemes with his mother and and tricks his father. But here it's a supplanter too. Is that uh, he is he is taking his what it belongs to his brother and taking uh, his playing uh, his using his brother's weakness. The idea that he's faint and hungry and his brother doesn't really respect the value of the birthright. He's not taking it that seriously. And, and so he takes advantage of that, and he gets his brother to give his birthright. I don't see any significance in that later, though, because as we, we know coming up, uh, there's a second uh, time that he they do something to get this birthright this, or a blessing. But um, so if he, I don't, I never did understand if, if he's already got the birthright given to him through this deal he made with Esau, uh, I'm not sure what the need was for. The trick on on uh, the father later. Well, you know, I think they've done so because um, had Isaac knew, then he wouldn't have blessed Jacob. Uh, because I'm sure his, their father didn't know about the, uh, you know Esau selling his birthright. You know, I, I think it, I think this was between then. Uh, obviously, Esau didn't consult with his father, uh, being unwise as such. So, you know, uh, that's probably why they have to go through that route, you know, to to fool, so to speak, to fool Isaac uh, into believing Jacob is Esau. Esau. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All right, so now we're getting to that point here. We come to uh, chapter 27, and um, our, uh, Isaac is old. They know he's old and uh, half blind, and and uh, he's uh, um, he's he's going to be dying very soon. So, mother Rebecca and Jacob make a scheme together. Let's just go to look at uh, chapter 27 and. Uh, and it came to pass that when Jake, when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his oldest son, and said unto him, My son. And he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold now, I am old. I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow, and go out to the field and take me some venison. It's kind of like that. That's his his request for his last meal, I guess. And make me savory meat, such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless me before I die. Okay, so uh, it, we see that it's in it, the the intention of Isaac to give this blessing uh, to Esau, and uh, Isaac knows he's about to die and he wants for his last meal his favorite food. What's your favorite food, brother? If you if you had to request a meal for your last meal, what would you get? Uh, that would be venison. Wow. That's pretty <laughs> amazing. Yeah. I've never I've, I've asked a lot of people that question and uh, I've never heard anybody ever pick venison before. Just you and, you and Isaac, man. You and Isaac love that venison. Not many, not, not not many have tasted it. I probably take uh, I probably take fried chicken and bacon and eggs. That's what I'd want. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that, uh, so, that won't be for me. <laughs> uh, so we we see that in this chapter though that um, it is the intention of Isaac to bless Esau, but Rebecca and uh, uh, Jacob are aware of what's going on, so they make a plan. Says, uh, 
And Rebekah heard when Isaac spake to Esau, his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau, thy brother, saying, Bring me venison and make me savory meat that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord, uh, be before the Lord, before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock and fetch me from thence two good kids of um, kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. Uh, so. Uh, and Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. My father, peradventure, will feel me and shall see, seem to him as a deceiver, and I shall bring a curse upon me <laughs> and not a blessing. And his mother said unto him, Upon me be thy curse, my son. Only obey my voice and go fetch me them. Uh, so there's quite a scheme that they have going on there. It's quite deceitful. Well, um, you know, the uh, in the art of war by Sun Tzu, it, 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 you know, one of the things he said was, uh, in order to defeat an enemy, enemy, you gotta know them, <laughs> you know, and and in order to know them, you gotta be uh, really good with the information and espionage and, and things, and I think that's one of the reasons that we observe Israel. Uh, you know, I mean, Israel is really good at, you know, spying and espionaging. Uh, and that's what Rebecca uh, is, is doing here. So, um, I, you know, it's maybe, um, <laughs> I, cannot, I, cannot, I cannot really say what to say to what, uh, what Rebecca has done. Um, it's, it's, I don't think that's a it's, it's a good thing, <laughs> but since Rebecca favored um, uh, since Rebecca favored the uh, Jacob, uh, surely uh, she uh, she knows about this blessing. And I I don't know maybe they had a conversation Rebecca and uh, Jacob about birthright and all. Uh, certainly Jacob knew uh, what the birthright would bring him. And certainly, I'm sure, being so close to Rebecca, probably uh, Jacob shared that information with Rebecca, and Rebecca knew uh, uh, what uh, what his father is going to do. So that's one of the reason why that um, to fulfill that so-called birthright blessing, you know, uh, they were, you know, scheming this sort of uh, uh, little plan, you know. <laughs> Well, I, I, it's very interesting how you connected some dots there that I hadn't considered. But uh, uh, re regardless of that, it's still very deceitful uh, and uh, against the wishes of, of uh, Isaac. Uh, and, uh, but you know what? It, it doesn't surprise me because the whole family is deceitful. We got Abraham lied about Sarah being his wife. <laughs> and then Isaac lied about Rebecca being his wife, uh, and now we got Jacob and Rebecca scheming. And maybe Rebecca preferred Jacob because they were so much alike. They're both like schemers and conniving, and you know, <laughs> doing this dirty, dirty trick. Uh, uh, but uh, we if, know, uh, if they're deceiving uh, to curse someone, if they're deceiving to curse curse some people. Uh, I would say that that's pretty bad, but here there are so-called coveting after this blessing. Uh, yeah. So I don't I don't really see them doing such wrong. After all, uh, Esau sold his uh, birthright and he despised it. Mm -hmm. you know, so. Now, brother, you, uh, what's your opinion? Do you believe that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are saved? Uh, they're, they're in heaven. Yes, of course. Yeah, of course. Of course, I think most most Christians would agree with that. And yet, we see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We also see um, uh, uh, 
King David and other descendants, what he did uh, we, uh, with murdering and adultery. We know what Moses did committing uh, murder, uh, murdering an Egyptian. And, and, all, and, and we know what Paul did uh, murdering the church before he became a Christian. And we know what Peter did denying the Lord three times. It, all these people who are these great figures, great characters in the scriptures, saints that we all admire so much, and yet every one of them has these serious flaws that are there for everybody to see. It's not hidden. And no one is attempting to conceal it and make it seem like they're perfect. Uh, all the flaws are, are just laid out for us to see, and yet we see that they are saved. They, they have eternal life. And that sure help, certainly helps me a lot because I understand that uh, in spite of their flaws, God loved them and saved them. And in spite of my flaws, he's loved, loves me and saved me. Yes, amen. You know, only through Jesus Christ. Yeah. Okay, let's look at the next scripture come out here. Uh, uh, so, um, One thing interesting here is that uh, uh, Jacob clearly knows what the consequences would be for uh, for deceiving his father. And uh, but what's more interesting is that his mother is saying that, you know, upon me thy curse. And, uh, you know, that much, uh, that much, how much, that much she loved his, uh, her, uh, her, her son, Jacob, you know. If their deception, so to say, is is busted, you know, all of that bad things would be on to Rebecca, and you know, that sort of, um, um, I, I don't know, love, I guess, for for his son, for her son. Yeah, but that's that's also assuming that Rebecca has the authority to cause the curse to be transferred onto her. Uh, uh, she's assuming that. She can just say, "Well, no, the curse not be on you, but be on me instead." And then that God's, or the, you know, that that's the way cursing works. You know, right. <laughs> I'm not sure if you, if someone's going to be cursed, that so you can say, "No, no, I'll take the curse." Right, right. And also, they they are talking about. I never had uh, keys of the goats, uh, and maybe there is a special way to prepare uh, to the point that. It would taste uh, the same or similar to venison, because like uh, Isaac, he's he he probably had many times of this meat, yet he couldn't tell the difference. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, that's, that's a that, on. that is interesting. Have you ever eaten goats? No, I haven't. I I had I had some sheep. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Never had gold. Uh, yeah, lamb chops are good. I know that. And uh, lamb, uh, what is it called? Uh, lamb shank. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lamb is really good. Uh, but I don't. I've never had goat either. Um, I've never had goat's milk, goat's cheese, or goat's milk. All right, let's go to the next verse. And, and Rebecca took goodly raiment of her eldest son Esau which were with her in the house and put them upon Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck. And she gave the savory meat and the bread in which she had prepared into the hand of her son, Jacob. And when, and he came unto his father and said, my father, and he said, here am I, who art thou my son? Let's stop there. That's uh, a lot of things that they've done to try to pull the wool or the goat skin, goat hairs over the eyes <laughs> of Isaac. Huh? Yeah, I mean, uh, Esau, he was quite a hairy man, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> <laughs> well, his hair is all over the place. I mean, he's kind of eight man or something. <laughs> that seems yeah. odd. Doesn't it seem odd that uh, two two males born as twins? Obviously, they were not identical twins. Right. But, uh, you, you know, it, we, it, it tells us they're physically different in appearance. 
and yet uh, they're twins. And right. and being twins, they don't even have this simple basic similarities. And one's very hairy with red hair, and the other is not hairy at all. And and they're not also very different in terms of their attitudes and, and uh, talents. Uh, so they really could be, couldn't be more different than each other, even though they're twins. Right. Um, obviously, they're fraternal twins. And, um, you know, like the movie Twin, <laughs> they were quite different. <laughs> oh, no, I almost choked I, when I called you said that. The difference between Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger is is uh, pretty much good contrast, like we have here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's see how, how this story plays out here. Um, and um, so, and, and so he goes to his father, and he came unto his father and said, "My father," and he said, "Here am I. Who art thou, my son?" And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, my firstborn. Wow. So not only is he lying and saying, I am Esau, uh, but he throws in thy firstborn right on top of it. I am done according to, as thou badest me arise. I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison that thy soul may bless me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, obviously, when uh, Jacob said, my father, and here am I, you know, I mean, Isaac immediately, you know, uh, kind of, he probably, I'm sure Jacob was trying to pretend uh, Esau's voice, and obviously, uh, Isaac, he, he didn't know, um, he wasn't sure which one it is. That's probably why he was saying, who art thou? I'm sure it's one of his son, he's for sure. But who art thou, my son? Yes. Are you Isaac or Esau, in a way? Yeah, uh, he uh, must be pretty, uh, not only blind, but maybe even his hearing is not as good, and he can't really distinguish that much between the voices. Uh, it sounds like he's a little bit, uh, uh, maybe, um, skeptical as we read on here. Um, right. And Isaac said unto my, his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. Oh, wow. Oh, gosh. Isaac, he's even bringing the Lord into his life. Oh. <laughs> and Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee. So see, we see that. Isaac is suspicious and he says I, that I may feel thee because he knows that there's this obvious, yeah, weird. Difference, this obvious difference. My son, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. So, um, you know, uh, uh, Jacob, uh, he predicted uh, early on that uh, there was going to be a need to, uh, to uh, uh, Cover this skin because he's he he knew that his father could tell right away by by touching him it wasn't him. Right, and verse twenty two it says the voice is Jacob's, you know. Yeah. So Isaac Isaac could you know distinguish between the two, but obviously he, he's he's he can barely see. Yeah. Um, Verse 22, and Jacob went near unto Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, the voice is Jacob. No, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned or not because his hands were hairy as his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. And he said, art thou my very son Esau? And he said, I am. And he said, bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him, and he did eat, and he brought him wine, and he drank. And his father Isaac said unto him, come near me now, and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of the rament. <laughs> oh, see, uh, Rebecca was so smart and conniving. She even put, gave him uh, Esau's clothing so that the scent and the smell of Esau would be on him too. Uh, 
and, and, he, and said, see, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. Therefore, God, give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be every one that curseth thee and blessed be he that blesseth thee. And it came to pass as soon as Isaac had made an end of the blessing uh, of blessing Jacob and Jacob was yet scarce gone out of the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother came in from his hunting. Just in the nick of time. Huh? <laughs> God. Yeah. Yeah. Quite dramatic here. Yeah. So Rebecca and, and uh, Jacob were, uh, they had quite a scheme and they thought of everything from the smell to the feel, everything. Yeah. Yeah. Now here's a sad part coming up. Uh, and he also had made savory meat and brought it unto his father and said unto his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's venison that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac, his father said unto him, who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn Esau. Wow. And Isaac trembled very exceedingly. Gosh. <laughs> Wow. So I guess, you know, once once this blessing was done, it, like irrevocable, you can't take it back and change it. And even if, it, even if you were deceived, it still applies. Well, it seems like that to me here, you know. It's like some kind of signed contract or something that's irrevocable, you know. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? Where is he that hath taken venison and brought it to me? And I have eaten of all before you came and have blessed him. Yea, and he shall be blessed. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and bitter cry. He said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O oh my father. Oh, man. That's tragic. Oh. It seems like Esau is taking this very seriously now, this blessing, this being this firstborn and his inheritance. <laughs> wow. Well, this is, I guess. At know. least uh, Esau knew what blessing meant. He, he certainly didn't know what for, uh, birthright meant to the yeah. point he despised it. Um. Yeah. And he said, thy brother came with subtlety and hath taken away thy blessing. And he said, it is not he rightly named, <laughs> and he said, it is not he rightly named Jacob, for he hath supplanted me these two times. <laughs> he took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? Oh man, this is this really this is a sad, sad thing. Wow. Yeah, well, too bad Esau, you know, throwing time from my feet. That's what you get. <laughs> too bad, you say. Too bad. Oh man, don't you have any pity for Esau and, and, and Jacob too? I mean and Isaac and Isaac didn't want to give the blessing to Jacob, so he was deceived. And Esau basically had his blessing and birthright almost stolen from him, he supplanted. And he said, Boy, they sure, they, you sure gave him the right name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, um, the, um, the names, I've said this before this, about these names in the scriptures, and I've often wondered, um, it seems like name giving is, is almost prophetic in the Bible. When mm -hmm. someone's born, you give them a name, and the name uh, turns out to describe them perfectly, something in their life. And right. why would you name 
Uh, I have a child, and, 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 and the first thing I do is I call him. He's a, he's a supplanter and a, and a deceiver, a trickster, a schemer. That's what I'm going to call him, schemer. <laughs> I would never, when my child was born, I would never name them schemer. I guess that sort of thing was kind of common during the time. That you know, the more you scheme, <laughs> the better you get it, or something. <laughs> well, you know that uh, the, the Jewish. This may sound, uh, you know, bigoted or something, but and, and stereotypical. Uh, but the, the the Jewish people as a whole have been thought of that in that way, uh, historically, as being schemers and uh, you know uh, taking advantage of people in business deals and and. Uh, uh, it, it, there's a long history of, of charges against them of that, of that kind, and I, I don't know if it's fair to uh, stereotype the whole uh, class of people that way. Well, we know that with Jacob, he was later called Israel, uh, <laughs> that uh, he's the, you know certainly uh, he, this idea of being a schemer, supplanter, deceiver stuff certainly applied to, to the first Israelite. Well, the uh, according to a wiki, <laughs> I'm just searching. Uh, the name comes. It says name comes either from Hebrew root, meaning to follow, to be behind, but also to supplement, uh, circumvent, assail, uh, overreach, or from the word for heal. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Maybe they gave him the name Jake, um, a Jacob because he followed Esau out of the birth canal or the, because he had a hold of his heel, but it had a double meaning. It's like double entendre, you know. Okay, he named him that because he, he followed Esau, but it just so happens that it also means deceiver, supplanter, schemer. Right. Wow, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, and to me, this is a, like a tragic story here. Uh, um, well, you know, Isaac does bless uh, Esau uh, later on, and that's, that's probably, I mean, maybe that's probably the reason why um, the uh, Arabs and or the Muslims nowadays uh, they have been living by the sword, and. Uh, and also, um, they were blessed with a whole bunch of oil. <laughs> yeah. You know, they are. Fatness of the earth, so to say. Yeah. Uh, so, it on to say, uh, um, Esau says to his father, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given to him. For servants, and with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now to thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me even also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Wow. It's just really, to me, uh, uh, Esau said, uh, even though he didn't take his birthright seriously, uh, everything else I've ever seen about Esau uh, that we're going to con continue studying the relationship with Esau and Jacob, it, it seems to me that Esau was the one that had good character uh, relative to, to uh, Jacob. Um, yeah, um, I mean, I could, I could see him um, being a good guy. But then again, no behavior of any man would save uh, save him. Um, yeah, but I mean, if I was going to pick a favorite, you're talking about how you know have, you have favorite children. Well, uh, obviously, I'm just from what I can read about them. I I I favor Esau in terms of my preference for him as a man. Yes, yes, uh, I, I I would agree with that. You know. And Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and the dew of heaven from above. And in other words, you're on your own. <laughs> you're on your own. 
<laughs> and by thy sword shalt thou live. Wow, okay, that's where that comes into play, huh? Because we know that um, his descendants, even today, uh, are, are using that sword, uh, heading uh, non Muslim. And by thy sword shalt thou live, and shalt serve thy brother, and it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. Oh, so there's a prophecy. Wow. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. So it tells you right here that it, you know, it's not that good. <laughs> so, yeah, but can you blame him? I mean, you know, if he's going to like slay his brother, uh, you know, for uh, for the things that he has done, um, I, 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 I. I guess I couldn't blame him as much, but to slay his brother, that is that, that is where I, I would uh, draw the line, you know. Ah, oh, man, I'll tell you, people have been slain for a lot less. I mean, if you look at the difference between the blessing for Jacob and the blessing for Esau, uh, there, there's a, I mean, <laughs> pull an awful lot from Esau, and people have been murdered for a lot less than that. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, like, in verse 42, it says, And these words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah. So I could see what kind of character Esau would be. I mean, you know, he, he, he's a character to the point that he would announce to slay his brother, you know, and to the point that those words would be heard to Rebekah. And, and such. So he is not really a thoughtful man. He, he's, he goes by his so-called instinct, I guess, in a way. Um, he, he can, he's not a, he's a sore loser, you know, and, and such, to the point that he would be throwing his tantrum and such. Um, I, it's very much like Many Muslims I see these days, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, but yeah, that's true. Are you an anti-Muslim person? Oh no, I'm not an anti-Muslim, but I am anti-Islam. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, I mean, it, yeah, I'm I'm anti-Muslim if they're if they're actually following Islam, because by following Islam. Uh, they are, they, if, they're, if they're a true Muslim, they're living by the teachings of the Quran and the Hadiths, then uh, the real Muslims in the Middle East today are the radical ones. They're the ones that are doing what the Quran and the Hadiths tell them to do, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, it's, you seem to be much more, you're much more understanding of the scheme and the theft uh, than, than I am. Uh, but Esau, I do see their relationship where he seems to be. Uh, uh, you know, he's all emotional and reactive, and uh, he, he wants to murder. He's not forgiving and murdering. Well, he does forgive later, as we know. That will come up later. Right. But uh, uh, maybe he tells his mother because he's double-minded here. He wants to kill his brother, but he, he must know that by telling his mother, his mother is going to tell him, and he's going to get it. He's going to escape. Mm hmm well, it says these words of Esau, her eldest son, were told to uh, Rebecca, meaning um, someone overheard it, and um, whether Esau was speaking to himself and you know, one of the servants heard them and passed it on to uh, Rebecca or whatever. But I don't think Esau directly told her toward his mother about. about yeah, I think the grammar. I think the grammar of that sentence that could be the case. Um, Maybe he didn't tell her directly. Uh, so, and she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau, as touching thee, doth comfort him, himself, purposing to kill thee. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice, arise. Flee now to Laban, my brother, and to Haran. 
and tarry with him a few days until my brother's fury turned away. Wow. So also Rebecca knew uh, what sort of person Isa uh, was. Uh, he, I think he's very hot-tempered. Uh, but in given time, that his fury would subside. Uh, so, Rebecca, I think, uh, uh, passed on a lot of her gene to Jacob. First of all, and uh, she she is quite a quite a wise lady, you know. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, uh, she thinks that uh, his his. Uh, He's going to forget about it in a few days. I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> it seems awful serious. I don't know why he just a few days go by. Maybe his temper would, would calm down a little bit, but uh, I don't think he's just going to forget. He says, until my brother's anger turn away from me, and he forget that which now has done to him. Oh, man. Uh, now in 46, and Rebecca said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. And if, if Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are of the daughters of the land, the, what shall my life do me? So uh, I don't know what the daughters of Heth are. She didn't want him to marry the daughters of Heth. She wanted him to go back. So often they, they are sent back to go find uh, someone to marry their own, their own family. You know, I think it's one of the also excuse or little scheme that Rebecca is pulling <laughs> with Isaac to uh, put away uh, Jacob, obviously. So, yeah. And, uh, and now we'll go to chapter 28. It says, And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto thou, uh, Thou shalt not take the wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Canaan around the house of Bethuel, my mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. So uh, uh, Isaac and uh, Rebekah are in agreement on him. Uh, uh, not marrying the, these the wrong people and, and, and marrying into the right family, into his, you know, there are all there's a lot of intermarrying going on at that time. You know, you don't have to uh, be a distant, distant, even a distant relative, a close relatives marry each other. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, so he goes on now to, um, and when he, he, Isaac sent him, sent away Jacob, this is verse 5, 28, and he went to Padan Aram, and to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob and Esau's mother. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram, it sounds like he blessed him again. Is this just another blessing for him to go off on a journey? <laughs> this is not a. This is not the. Not re referencing back to the original blessing, is he? Or is, it, is this another blessing where he's saying, "Go off, uh, blessing you to go off on this journey to get a wife"? Well, you know, when we say "God bless you." Um it's, it's like, um, in a way, kind of farewell and gi uh, giving them farewell. So, yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, and thou hast, verse 7, and that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Padan Aram, and Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not <laughs> Isaac, his father, then went. Esau unto Ishmael. So you see, here's the connection between Ishmael, who was not the intended son of Abraham, uh, and, and Esau, Esau, the one that was uh, uh, had his inheritance stolen from him. Now they become allies, and it, it, he intermarries with them. 
and mm -hmm. he was told he was told not to not to intermarry with them, but he does it to spite his father. Right. Wow. So, so he took wives. Go ahead. He does every every stupid things. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, you're right. You know, uh, on one hand, he he's uh, he's uh, seemed like uh, I I pity him what was done to him. On the other hand, you see his reaction is he wants to murder his brother and he wants to intermarry with people his father and mother told him not to intermarry with, and he's doing it just despite them. So he right. certainly has some uh, some character problems that uh, we certainly uh, would do not like. Yeah. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night. And he dreamed, oh, here's the part about the ladder. And he dreamed and beheld a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and ascending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, my father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou lit liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south, and thee, and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So the blessing that was given to Abraham and Isaac and it was now is passed on to, to uh, uh, Jacob. So apparently God... God is in agreement. Even though this was done deceitfully, God has also given his blessing on this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we can see that Jacob, uh, throughout what we have read, uh, has been quite obedient to his parents. Um, he, whereas Esau, he wasn't he was obedient, but you know, but when he doesn't want to obey, he wouldn't, he wouldn't do it. It's like one of those uh, parables that Jesus told about two sons, where you know, uh, go on. Uh, his father would say, "Go, go do this," and his other son would say, "He would say, yes, I will, I will," and he does not. And yet, the other son would say, uh, "I wouldn't," but he does it. Uh, yeah. Uh, so God kind of knew that he would be obedient, uh, and Jacob, being obedient to his parents, listening to uh, uh, Isaac and uh, and Rebecca uh, about him, especially his marriage, uh, it did, in a way, uh, the heart of Jacob is more pleasing to God. You know. Yeah. Well, I can see how God. Would would uh, frown upon Esau's uh, um, attitude that his his uh, first uh, the his um, uh, what was it firstborn status of uh, what was it the inheritance what was that called again it wasn't a blessing it was a birthright birthright yeah um, his attitude towards that birthright. Was was not serious. He didn't respect it. He didn't appreciate the value of it. He just kind of laughed it off. Okay, for a bowl of food, uh, you can have it. So I, I think God, knowing that his attitude towards this whole thing was was not. He wasn't taking it seriously enough. You know? That would that's reason there that God would say, no, he's not the one. Jacob, uh, he values this uh, uh, so much. That he's even willing to fight and scheme over it. He and, and the mother, they, they know the value of it. And so, therefore, God says they're the ones that I want because they appreciate it. Right. And also, um, um, I think it is important to note that uh, why Isaac favored Esau, you know, um, he favored him because of physical means, um, something fleshy, worldly means. Uh, whereas uh, Jacob, uh, he knew exactly uh, those things are not really that important, um, but he knew what would be more important. Um, so, in that regards, uh, I guess 
uh, God favored uh, Jacob over Esau. Yeah. But what about the what about the women in this this whole thing? Uh, you got uh, each of the women are conniving, not not faithful to, uh, uh, and really uh, the, the, kind of they're the uh, they're the troublemakers. Uh, Sarah is the one that convinced Abraham to uh, not believe God about the promise that she would have a, a son, and and instead. Go lay with Hagar and have a son. Sarah uh, designed that whole thing, and that, then you got Rebecca. Uh, she, she took it upon herself to instigate this whole thing with uh, with uh, Jacob to steal the, the blessing. Right. Well, you know, God did provide women as uh, um, help me, help me in a way. And that doesn't mean that uh, women is below man. Uh, in order to help anybody, you have to be better than that person, in a way. <laughs> so otherwise, you will ruin everything. Uh, as much they could be hindrance, uh, without Rebecca in this story, uh, you know, that's, that sort of promise, uh, the covenant, wouldn't, wouldn't have fulfilled, in a way. So... I think uh, women are very important, uh, and also uh, behind great men, there's uh, there's great women, obviously. Um, but um, for men, I think it is very important to either have a good sight or uh, able to have enough wisdom to filter out certain things. You know. Yeah. Well, we could trace it back much further, all the way back to Eve, too. And look what she did. She was behind the fall. She's the one that instigated that, along with uh, uh, Satan. Um, Adam, it wasn't his idea. He wasn't the one that was persuaded by Satan. So um, it just seems that women have been uh, stirring up trouble uh, through all this whole, from, um, from Genesis all the way up, um, all the way through Genesis. The thing is, also, we got to realize... Um, Adam blamed God, you know, because of this woman you gave me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, you know, he blamed God for, for women, uh, for what he has done. But what one thing that we notice here also is that Isaac is not blaming God at all here. You know, he's, 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 not, he's not blaming anyone, actually, for what he has done or what kind of faulty things that he has made. Uh, but the um, we only blame what we see is uh, Esau, in a way. Yeah. But I, you know, you know, like if he were to like truly uh, be stunned about this, and if he truly felt that there were, it, it wasn't something right, then I'm sure he would have prayed about it. He, he probably would have asked God about it. But I think deep inside, uh, Isaac also knew what sort of character. Esau was, in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To me. He, he's, he, he didn't, in other words, he didn't go out of his way to uh, uh, to reverse the, the blessing or, um, you know, he, he didn't, like, scorn Jacob, you know. Uh, he didn't really blame God or ask God about, you know, about that incident. Uh, we don't see any of those, and he just takes it as it is, as it whatever happened happened in a way. Mm -hmm. So that is something to um, to <laughs> to consider as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's go on here. Uh, 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 but in verse fourteen, in this uh, blessing. Uh, that uh, Esau asked his father for, um, one of the things it says is, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. Uh, oh, no, that's Isaac's blessing. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I'll leave Bethel. Verse 14, yeah, you're right. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not, I scroll backward accidentally. I just, where am I now? Let me see the father's. Verse, I think you were reading, you had to read uh, verse 14. And thy seed shall be as dust of the earth, 
and by shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south and be in thee and in thy sea shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Yeah. Amen. Jesus Christ right there. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. So this is a, was this a dream? It says, and Jacob will wake out of his sleep. And he said, show me the warriors in this place. Uh, but I was interested in this ladder. I was just saying about Jacob's ladder. And he, in verse 12, and he dreamed and a ladder, a holy ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. Uh, to me, this is a, this verse here uh, is a, a problem verse because so many people, uh, whether they're, uh, some sect of Christianity or uh, Judea, Judaism or, uh, or Muslim or many other religions, the idea of climbing your way up to heaven through your own effort is the big lie. Uh, it's, the, it's, the, uh, it's the false message that people can get to heaven through personal merit. And this Jacob's Ladder is an illustration of that to me. And they're taking it, I don't know what to take of it in this case here, but we know that a person cannot strive and get up to heaven that way. Well, you know, um, uh, this, is, this letter is not Jacob's letter. It's just, it's just named as people just kind of consider that as uh, Jacob's letter. But, you know, this is a letter set up so that the, the angels of God would yes. ascend and descend, not Jacob. <laughs> yeah. no. Yeah, so that's the that's the main thing that people are missing here uh, is that the, uh, the in no way it does this tell us that man goes up to heaven on that ladder. It's it's an illustration of how angels are coming, uh, you know, they're interacting with mankind and they're coming down from heaven. And it's I'm sure it's a, it's a dream, so it's symbolic. I don't think there's an actual ladder that angels use, but the idea of the ladder. Uh, has been misconstrued by a lot of people who think that they can climb this ladder on their own and get to heaven through uh, through personal merit. Right, because they misinterpret the scripture. Mm -hmm. uh, so now let's go down to uh, verse 17. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for pillars, pillows. <laughs> I, I'd hate to have a stone for a pillow, wouldn't you? <laughs> Unless you have a, quite, quite a cushiony head or a lot of you know, hair on your head or whatever. Yeah, you have to <laughs> you have a turban or whatever, then it might work. But uh, sleeping without a pillow is a hard thing to do. I don't. I get a bad kink in my neck if I don't have some sort of pillow. So, I guess I'd use a stone and put my coat over it or something. I don't know. Uh, and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and remnant to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And for all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So here's the idea of the tenth, the tithe. Here. Uh, uh, is this the first uh, first instance of the tenth? Well, Abraham gave tenth to uh, Melchizedek. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. I knew that was, but I forgot the chronology of it for a second. Yeah. So, uh, but I I heard someone teach on that recently. I think it was uh, Gospel of Grace, not the Gospel of Grace, the uh, Grace Roots. You know, uh, Mike and Joel. Uh, I think them talk, they were talking about this as being the tenth being um, the spoils of war. When, when Abraham defeated this people and they took the spoils and then they gave 
a tenth of the spoils to uh, Melchizedek. Uh, I, I don't think it was intended to be a, a tenth of your, your earnings, a uh, tenth of everything you own. But uh, that's another subject. Mm -hmm. So here we have... Uh, but the tenth is, is the one that's significant. Why, why the ninth? Why not, why not fourth? But the tenth, you know? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Do you? you have any idea? Well, I, I, I'm sure there's a good explanation for that, but um, and I, I, why 10th? Uh, <laughs> not sure. Well, you know, in the decimal system, it's certainly easy to calculate a 10th, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... Um, Verse 29, then Jacob went on his journey and came into the land of the people of the east, and he looked and behold a well in the field, and lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it, for out of that well they watered the flocks, and a great stone was upon the well's mouth, and thither were all the flocks gathered, and they rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the sheep, with the stone again upon the well's mouth in its place, and Jacob said unto them, My brethren, whence be ye? And they said, Of Haran are we. And he said unto them, Know ye Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And he said unto them, Is he well? And he said, He is well. And behold, Rachel, his daughter, cometh with the sheep. So this is when he gets smitten. Brother, have you ever been smitten? Um, yeah, a few times in high school. <laughs> I can still remember the first time I laid eyes on my wife. I mean, I can picture it like it just happened five minutes ago. It's just amazing. And uh, but that's what happened with with him and Rachel here. When he meets Rachel, I mean, it's his love at first sight. And uh, but we know that all the scheming and things that he did uh, with. Uh, uh, with uh, against Esau, that uh, he, he's going to have uh, some bad things happen to him. Things are going to backfire on him over over Rachel, aren't they? That's all coming up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so he uh, he becomes a victim of uh, was it Laban or Nahor? One of them is uh, uh, is it Laban, the father of Rachel? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, and, and while ye had spake with him, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. And it came to pass, when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. And Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up. <laughs> oh, man, his voice and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother, and that so he was his her father's brother. He, that he was her father's brother. I don't get that. Let me see. What is the relationship here exactly? And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother. It can't be because Jacob's uh, brother is Esau. He's not the brother of... Uh, he was the Rebecca's son, you know. And that he was Rebecca's son, and she ran and told her father. So the in brother-in-law, he meaning um, his father probably. Okay, so um, now uh, Rachel's mother, uh, Rachel's father is the brother of Rebecca. So uh, that would be the uncle. That they would be cousins, then, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're cousins, first cousins. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I talked about this in a previous study when you weren't here with me. But this this intermarrying. I mean, obviously, there had to be direct intermarrying uh, to get the uh, humanity started, uh, uh, marrying uh, siblings and. Uh, and uh, today, of course, I guess, I don't know if it's universal around the world, uh, but in, in America, at least we know that we don't 
want to marry really close relatives, I guess there are kind of possible genetic uh, uh, consequences uh, that we, we have when we intermarry too closely. And, uh, uh, but it, obviously it had to be done to get the humanity started. And, and there, I guess there were not these genetic consequences. Uh, but I think as the fall progressed, people lived, didn't live as long and they had to marry a farther apart or instead of close relatives uh, because the genetic code was, was, uh, wasn't working, working as well as, as the fall had more of an impact on us. Is, do you think that's the case? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously as time goes by, as generation goes by, the, uh, the genetic uh, makeup, the pool uh, can exhaust itself and, and, and result in some sort of deformity and, and such. But during this time, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, the, it was the case. Uh, there are plenty of uh, information for, uh, uh, for the first cousins to get married. And, and things. Yeah, I think right now uh, I think it's advisable to not be at least to, to be at least second cousins, isn't it? I'm not sure about that, but yeah, but I, I think certain states that you could marry your cousin or something. But I I, I, I would be sure about that. Yeah, we have to be careful not to uh, not to um, label a group of people or a certain part of the country because I mean certain parts of the country a lot of a lot of the liberals um, are already um, labeling labeling as, as uh, uh, you know uh, backward uh, Christians they love their Bibles and their guns and they intermarry and stuff <laughs> you know so that's, that's not good that they uh, um, At this time, the genetic information was uh, were, was plenty enough so that they, even though they intermarry, uh, there won't be any deformity or yeah. or mutation. Um, but nowadays, we can observe that from the uh, from England, uh, you know, where the so-called royals would marrying within the family, and and we we see a lot of deformity and we see a lot of you know, weird things come out come out of that, you know. Yeah. Insanity. I've exhausted it. And deformities and insanities, I guess, is some of the things. Uh, so verse 13, And it came to pass when Laban heard the tidings of Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to the, his house. And he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, Surely thou art my bone and my flesh. And he abode with him the space of a month. And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? Tell me, what shall thy wages be? And Laban had two daughters, and the name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel, and Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful. Tender-eyed, I've never heard that expression, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. Have you ever heard tender-eyed before? Well, you know, they say that, uh, you know, what, what eyes represent. Um, and uh, I think I think Leah had a uh, tender soul, whereas Rachel uh, was beautiful uh, outwardly, you know. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, the, uh, so uh, the beauty of the two was Rachel, and apparently Leah was not, either beautiful or as attractive, was maybe plain. And so obviously uh, he's, he's attracted, uh, physically attracted to Rachel, and he makes a deal. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. So it was, uh, I guess, very common then that uh, you to get a uh, a wife, you had to uh, make this this kind of a deal uh, to get the wife. Uh, but I thought, what is the what is the term where? Uh, 
you have a dowry. Is, is, isn't that the opposite or am I confused? Where for a dowry, doesn't the father of the wife of the of the woman have to pay the, the other family? Or is the, man, the man pays uh, to the to the daughter father. Uh, so the man pays the dowry to the right. to the uh, parent to the father of the of the woman. So right. that's what this is. This would be some sort of a dowry to marry his wife. Then, right. But I'm just wondering why Jacob says seven years, not seven months. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems like uh, 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 Jacob jumps on the deal. He doesn't try to negotiate like Abraham tried to negotiate with God. He, so he's not negotiating at all. He just accepts it. He must. He must have said thought that was a good deal. <laughs> seven years, and during those seven years, um, I, I guess they were not married, and they did not have any kind of uh, conjugal relationship. Hmm. That would be uh, pretty, uh, pretty hard to love someone and be lusting for them because of their beauty, and you're working your butt off serving someone for seven years before you can have them as a wife, huh? <laughs> Well, Jacob finally met his match. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and as we know, uh, you know what they say is you reap what you sow. Well, <laughs> you know, all that, all that deceit and this, uh, the uh, uh, scheming and stuff certainly going to backfire and backfire on him with uh, Laban. Uh, and Jake, but the seven years just flew right by because, because it seemed like it'd be the opposite. Because if you wanted someone really bad and you can't wait to be with them, you have to wait seven years. It seemed like it would like, you know, time would stand still instead of going by so fast. Verse 21, and Jacob said unto Laban, give me my wife for my days are fulfilled. Well, I guess he's getting, he's quite frustrated and anxious now that I may go in unto her. <laughs> That's a euphemism, isn't it? I go in unto her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him, and he went in unto her. And Laban gave unto his daughter Leah Zilpah, his maid, for a handmaid. Now, I'm a little confused here. And Laban gathered up and it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him. And he went in unto her. And he went in unto her. Is this talking about Jacob went into uh, uh, with Leah? Because they're not married yet. And he doesn't realize that he's being tricked yet. Let me look. At so obviously, uh, Laban uh, is fooling Jacob. You know, just like Jacob fooled uh, Esau, uh, but uh, I don't know the costume. Costume during the time, maybe they they were uh, they had some veil. Uh, the the history happened during a, during the night time, so probably one of that's why Jacob didn't realize it. <clears throat> but certainly that uh, you know Laban gave um, his maid uh, to Leah. So to, I guess, to help her out and stuff. Yeah. So in, in the uh, Amplified Version, it says, uh, uh, verse 23, But when night came, he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob, who had intercourse with her. And Laban gave Zilpah, his maid, to his daughter Leah, to be her maid. But in the morning, Jacob saw his wife, and behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Did I not work for you all those seven years for Rachel? Why then have you deceived and cheated and thrown me down like this? And Laban said, it is not permitted in our country to give the younger in marriage before the elder. So there's his answer, but it's still, it was a lie. It was, it was a trick. So this trickster, Jacob, had a trick played on him. Well, you know, we know how Rebecca got all her moves, you know. <laughs> so probably runs in that, that uh, Laban family. But, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. basically uh, 
Jacob is getting what he saw. Yeah, it's uh, reaping what you sowed, I guess. And, uh, uh, you know, what goes around comes around. Um, uh, then he says, now he must have done something so that uh, Jacob did not realize that it was actually uh, Leah. Uh, it that doesn't does it doesn't say anything. Is there a veil? And if there was a veil, it seemed like before you had intercourse, you would be able to be able to remove the veil away. But um, that, do you remember? Does it come in the next few verses? Does it tell us at all about how this deception played out? Because it seemed like he should have been able to tell, uh, unless uh, unless he was either drunk and didn't realize it or if he was uh, uh, she had a veil on and he had intercourse with her and the veil would not be removed until the morning I, is, does that, is that coming up? I don't remember how that played out I can understand um, uh, that he would be fooled in a way uh, this happened during the night time and if Laban picked the night when there is no moon at all you know, I mean, these guys weren't living in a, a time of electricity, um, and uh, being a virgin, <laughs> not knowing what to do in a way, uh, all those, all that thing happened during the uh, in darkness. Uh, I, I, it is likely for him that that he he would think that uh, you know he was uh, he was he was having. Uh, their relationship with uh, with uh, what's her name, Rachel. Yeah. yeah. Wow. But uh, it seems that Laban has no uh, no apologies, uh, no uh, no remorse. He his answer is just uh, uh, it is not permitted in our country to give the younger in marriage before the older. So why did he agree to it if he knew that it wasn't permitted and that he uh, he wasn't couldn't do it? But and yet he lied about it. He's just another liar. But you know, Laban didn't lie. Actually, he he didn't he didn't disclose the information simply. You know, and also he didn't specify which seven years. <laughs> so. Oh, okay, yeah. So he'd have to work for her seven years. Uh, he ends up having to work another seven years. So the truth is, he did work seven years for Rachel, but he didn't realize that he was working the first seven years for Leah. Well, and also uh, he said his daughter, uh, and he didn't specify which daughter. I mean, he knew Jacob meant Rachel. He knew that uh, Jacob wanted her. What verse is that? Let me go back to the KJV. I'm, am I'm amplified right now. Uh, which verse uh, is, does that say that? Okay. He says 19, Laban said, It is better I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. He wasn't talking, he wasn't actually talking about, he, he was talking about Rachel, but he didn't really specify which one, and he didn't specify when, you know, when he would give Rachel to him. But he didn't, he didn't disclose the information about his tradition, but all this going on is in Jacob's head already, you know, that, um, you know, after seven years he'll get, go marry Rachel when that was not specified. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, when Jesus told the Pharisees that they follow the letter of the law and yet they don't uh, understand the heart of the law, which is what is what the, the true intention of the law. And uh, in this case, and it's the same kind of a situation, you know, the intention, the intention that, and the understanding that Jacob had was that he's going to work seven years for uh, Rachel. Uh, but technically, uh, he, uh, Laban never said Rachel at that moment. He, you know, in, in his mind, he had to work seven years to marry his daughter, and he didn't specify and say it. So on the technicality, you could say that Oh, according to the letter of their agreement, he didn't really break it, I guess. But but it, he certainly broke the, the heart of the law, the agreement. Right. And the good thing about the about it is that Jacob ends up with uh, with Rachel eventually, and with a lot of uh, a lot of uh, 
you know, the, uh, um, the uh, what, what do you call that, um, things, incomes. <laughs> so he, he ended up gaining a lot, a lot back eventually, but uh, he, he's, he, we noticed that he's not complaining like Esau. You know, Esau would be throwing tantrum like, where's my blessing, where's my blessing? <laughs> and Esau, if, if Jacob were Esau, uh, then he would, he would just go nuts, you know, kill, I'm going to kill everyone. <laughs> yeah. That kind of thing. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's very true there. That's, uh, uh, it is amazing to me how calmly Jacob accepts this. Right. Um, maybe he just realizes, hey, uh, I guess I deserve this. Look what I did to my brother Esau. And now, now this guy did, you know, for, forgive my language. I, I, I screwed Esau. And now this guy's screwing me. Mm -hmm. So it's really a, maybe maybe because he understood that hey I guess I deserve this after all what I did and he just accepted it. All right. Uh, and he went unto Rachel, and so um, so then he has to work seven more years, and uh, and Laban gave Rachel to his daughter to Bilha his handmaid to be her maid. And he went in unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him seven, yet seven other years. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Wow, another barren woman. Hmm. Remember Sarah was barren, Rebecca uh, was barren. Uh, yeah, yeah. And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. And for she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Oh, wow. That's, that's a sad thing, isn't it? That uh, Leah uh, knows that she was not the chosen one by Jacob, that he preferred and loved Rachel. And yet, uh, uh, she wanted him to love, to love her, and thought that now, finally, with the son, that he'd finally love her. Right. We could, we could, we could observe uh, her tender soul. You know, scripture did say she had tender eyes. I would, I would interpret that as having, you know, good heart, tender soul. And she here doesn't blame her husband for not loving her. You know, um, she's she she's remaining she she's remaining faithful, and she's uh, she's in she's constantly um, you know try to find the goodness of her affliction, so to say, hoping for the best in a way, uh, praying to God and such. So, yeah. If I were if I were twenties, I would pick Rachel, just like uh, just like Jacob. But if I were, if I'm uh, if I were to choose one now, I'll probably choose uh, you know Leah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I, I don't uh, see any. Um, I see Rachel has beauty, and right. Leah maybe has more inner beauty, but I don't see anything negative said about Rachel. Uh, right. She she doesn't seem to have any. There's no criticism put on her, uh, and yet I think what you said there is that hey, uh, uh, as we get older, uh, we realize that the character, the inner beauty of a person, is more important than the physical appearance. Right. But also we notice that the scripture doesn't say anything about uh, Rachel's reaction. You know, when I'm sure uh, Rachel, being this, being Leah's sister, she probably knew what was going on, and she could have, uh, she could have told uh, Jacob, "Hey, you know what? My sister Leah is in torment, and, and and such and such. Maybe you know you should look after her a little bit, <laughs> kind of thing." You know, there's nothing like that. So Rachel, Rachel. She's kind, of, she's kind of oblivious to the situation, just enjoying the life in a way. But um, whereas Leah 
it's like that um, Samuel's mother, you know, uh, being afflicted in a way. But um, that's probably why, you know, the Lord, God saw uh, her heart and um, blessed her with, with, you know, a bunch of kids, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so she does have, uh, we know that uh, uh, at some point uh, Jacob's going to, his name will be changed to Israel, and and Rachel uh, has, uh, I mean, uh, he has these 12 sons called the 12 tribes of Israel, and we see the beginnings of it here. We recognize these names. Um, so the first one she has is Reuben, and then as she conceived again, bear a son, and this his name is Simeon, and then the next one she has is uh, Levi, and then the next one she has is Judah. So she has four sons, and uh, all this while, Rachel has none. Mm -hmm. And that moves us into Genesis 30. Wow. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children, or else I die. God. Making a threat. <laughs> God. Well, it's not, I don't think it's for lack of trying by Jacob, I imagine. That's why Jacob was angry in the next verse. Yeah, and, and also, it's certainly, he, he, we certainly saw that uh, it's, it's not his uh physiological problem because he's certainly having plenty of children with uh, Leah. The problem must lie with, with Rachel, and yet she's, uh, she's telling Jacob, you know, like, yeah. you give her children. And, and Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. Well, that's interesting. I don't know why he get angry with her over that. Uh, and he said, Am I in God's stead who hath withheld from thee the fruit of thy womb? So he's saying, <laughs> blame God, don't blame me. And she said, behold, my maid Bilhah, go in unto her. Oh, see, there she goes again, right, with the same thing that uh, Sarah did. You know, Sarah didn't have confidence that uh, God was going to keep the promise, even though God promised them three different times she she got old. She didn't believe that God was going to keep the promise, and she told Abraham to go into Hagar, and she would have a child through Hagar. So somehow they think that they can give a it's like a surrogate, I guess. Uh, you give have birth, have a child with my servants, and you know, in, in a way, I guess in a way that'll be my child because my servant doesn't count. So I'll just pick the child, or I, I don't know if she gets to consider that child hers or what, but, and she shall bear upon my knees that I may also have children by her. I don't think it plays out that way, though. I, I think that the children of the, the handmaidens there are really considered their children, and it still doesn't count as, as uh, Rachel's children. And she gave him Bilhah, her handmaid, to wife. You know, a lot of a lot of men today might think this is a wonderful thing that these guys, uh, their wives, keep on saying, "Well, go ahead and have intercourse with this other woman here and have children with them." And pretty soon they've got a whole collection of handmaidens and wives. And uh, men might think, "Well, that's wonderful." I mean, especially like Mormons, you know, they. They, they've taken that to a, a modern time, saying that that applies today, that you should have many wives and have a lot of children with many wives. But I don't know. Uh, to me, I, I found it difficult. My, my, my wife and I have a wonderful marriage now, but it, it, we had an awful lot of hard times and an awful a lot of difficult years. Um, be, and, and I couldn't imagine having several wives. I mean, it, it's difficult enough to, to uh, have one, much less multiple wives. I mean, the person might think, oh, it's wonderful. You get to have uh, intercourse with a lot of different women. But boy, the, look at Solomon, what happened to him. He, he had all those wives and concubines, and 
Uh, he didn't still see, didn't seem to be very happy. He even said in one of the parables, uh, he said several times, he said, woe to the man w uh, with a, a, a nagging wife. It's better to live in the, in the tiny attic at the top of a big uh, a mansion to live in the attic alone than into, in a mansion with a, large, with a, with a nagging wife. He said, it's better to live off in the wilderness off by yourself than to live in a mansion with a nagging wife. He said, so, <laughs> or to live in the, in the desert uh, being with contentious women. Yeah. So, you know, you're right. You talked about when you were younger how your, your uh, attitude was a lot different. But, yeah, in the beginning, it's, it's the uh, physiological um, um, part outweighs our brain. <laughs> you know, that's our, One thing I'll tell you, Brother Luke, um, Jacob, is, Jacob uh, was surely sun-making machine, that's for sure. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, you can't, be blame, can't blame Jacob or that he was uh, impotent. He certainly... Uh, <laughs> he certainly uh, tried and succeeded at, uh, at spreading his seed, and his seed uh, uh, came to, to life with uh, with uh, all these, all of them. Uh, so, uh, and so, and Bill had conceived and bare Jacob a son, and Rachel, God hath judged me, and hath also heard my voice, and hath given me a son. Therefore, call call she his name Dan. So now he has five sons, and not one with Rachel yet. And Bilhah's, Rachel's maid conceived again, and bare Jacob a second son. And Rachel said, with great wrestling have I wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed. And she called his name Nephtali. It seemed like Rachel seemed like this is some kind of victory for her, having these sons with, through the handmaidens. Uh, and when Leah saw that she had left bearing, she took Zilpah. <laughs> so you know, Leah's not given to have any more children. She's now become barren. And now she wants to have more children. With, so she has her handmaid, Zilpah, and gave her to Jacob. So Jacob's, I wonder if he's happy about all this or, or if it's going to drive him crazy with, with all these uh, handmaidens and wives. And Zilpah, Leah's maid, bare Jacob a son. And Leah said, a troop cometh, and she called his name Gad. And Zilpah, Leah's maid, bare Jacob a second son. And Leah said, happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed. And, and uh, she called his name Asher. So Leah and Rachel seem to be quite happy about the handmaidens given birth. Somehow they, they seem to count as their sons, but not, yeah. not yes. During this time, you know, the, the tradition, you know, just like you know, surrogate mothers, you know, mm -hmm. despite they, they're, they're, they're in a sense of like borrowing someone else's womb, you know, mm -hmm. so taking that as their own kids. Mm -hmm. And Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them unto his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Give me, I pray thee, and thy son's mandrakes. And she said unto her, Is it a small matter that thou hast taken my husband? <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, and, and wouldst thou take away my son's mandrakes also? <laughs> What's a mandrake? Is, is it, that's some kind of something you eat, right? And it's, is it some kind of like a... Uh, in um, hallucinogenic uh, like mushroom or something? Well, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a plant. Hold on, let me, uh, let me dig it up in the dictionary. Mandrake, a Mediterranean plant of the nightshade family with white and purple flowers and large yellow berries. It has forked fleshy root that supposedly resembled the human form and was formerly widely used in medicine and magic, allegedly shrinking when pulled from the ground. Hmm. Allegedly what? Shrinking, shrink, I guess it makes some kind of shrinking sound. <laughs> uh, it says in the Amplified, 
in verse 14 says, Now Reuben went at the time of wheat harvest and found some mandrakes, love apples, in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Uh, so maybe it's it's either an aphrodisiac or, or it's a uh, uh, fertility um, um, value. Uh, and right. some, sort of, um, some sort of medicine, some sort of herbal medicine, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Leah, I'm reading the Amplified, verse 15. But Leah answered, Is it not enough that you have taken my husband without your taking away my son's mandrakes also? Yeah. And Leah, said, Rachel said, These sisters are, are not too happy with each other. And Rachel said, Jacob shall sleep with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. <laughs> God. And Jacob, God, Jacob just like a tool, you know. And Jacob came out of the field in the evening, and Leah went out to meet him and said, You must sleep with me tonight, for I have certainly paid your hire with my son's mandrakes. So he slept with her that night, and God heeded Leah's prayer, and she conceived and bore Jacob, her fifth son. So, wow, apparently it, it worked. Uh, fertility, Leah said, God has given me my heart because I have given my maid to my husband, and she called his name Issachar, hired. And Leah became pregnant again and bore Jacob her sixth son. And it, Leah said, God has endowed me with a good marriage gift for my husband, and now uh, will he dwell with me and regard me as his wife in reality. <laughs> I've been reading the Amplified. Because I have borne him six sons, and she named him Zebulun, which means dwelling. Afterwards, she bore a daughter and called her Dinah. Then God remembered Rachel and answered her pleading and made it possible for her to have children. And now for the first time, she, bare, she became pregnant and bore a son, and she said, God has taken away my reproach, disgrace, and humiliation. And she called his name Joseph, may he add, is the naming, meaning of that, and said, may the Lord add to me another son. When Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I may go to my own place and country. Huh. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, and let me go, for you know the work which I have done for you. And Laban said to him, If I have found favor in your sight, I pray you, do not go. For I have learned by experience and from the omens in divination that the Lord has favored me with blessings on your account. He said, State your salary and I will give it. Jacob answered him, You know how I have served you and how your possessions, your cattle and sheep and goats have fared with me. Uh, for you had little before I came, and it has increased and multiplied abundantly. And the Lord has favored you with blessings wherever I turn. But now when I shall provide for you my own, my own house also, Laban said, what shall I give you? Well, they're going to make the deal, but I, I need to cut this off here with verse 30 uh, because uh, I want to be able to end the show and have a chance to do a invitation for salvation before we get finished here but uh we'll, i'll pick up here next time uh, chapter 30 verse uh 30 30 30 uh, <laughs> is it to remember yeah um why don't you give kind of sum up the main things that we got from this today and then and then we'll tell people how to receive the gift of eternal life. Right. Um, well, we have observed uh, Jacob and Asu were, son, were the sons of Isaac and Rebekah. Uh, the twins, not Honor than the other guy, <laughs> but uh, the twins were quite different. Uh, even before they were born, uh, they were struggling together uh, to the point that um, you know, uh, Jacob would grab the heel of Esau, and they grew up quite differently. Uh, Jacob was a quite subtle, quiet man. Uh, 
favored by his mother. Uh, Isa was a hunter, uh, skillful sometimes, but you know, wasn't when when a day came, he wasn't so skillful, and he was so tired and hungry. Uh, because he despised his uh, birthright, he just kind of uh, lightly uh, and readily. Uh, uh, sold his birthright to his brother um, as as if it's something, as if it's nothing in a way. Uh, so Jacob kind of took that as an advantage. He got the birthright, uh, fooled his mother, I and mean, fooled his father with his mother uh, into blessing him. Uh, uh, you know, we kind of later on discovered that uh, and discussed that why God would, you know, bless such a schemer. Uh, and after all, uh, Jacob, you know, in a different way, uh, had to pay a little bit of consequences by working 14 years plus seven more years for his uncles, uh, Laban. But eventually, God blessed uh, all of them through Jacob because of his, his promise and uh, and finally he, he resulted in many uh, flocks and many goods that God has blessed him and the, you know uh, that's what we covered basically I think today uh, as we know through, uh, through the, uh, the lineage of Jacob and uh, Joseph and on, uh, Christ will ultimately come about, and, and all nation, all people would be blessed by him, um, and also kind of symbolically uh, shows what sort of uh, history that we are living in, and actually we are being witnesses of the things going on nowadays, especially in the Middle East. But uh, you know, I, I am quite, of, uh, quite excited to cover other uh, you know, characteristics of the, of the scripture, especially uh, Joseph uh, being my, uh, one of my favorite characters. Uh, but, um, you know, given time, that will be all taken care. Uh, but without further ado, I'll pass it on to you for that wonderful gospel message of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, brother. Uh, you must have, I don't know if it's just logical conclusion that we both reached uh, or you read my mind, but I was about to say that uh, uh, the next study we will be continuing on with Jacob and leading into Joseph, who is the next really prominent character in the scriptures. But what I'm trying to do in these character studies is from the beginning of the scriptures all the way through, take the most prominent significant characters and uh, try to learn about them. And uh, I think that uh, the next one that comes up of great prominence, uh, of great interest to us is, is Joseph. So we'll be going from uh, transitioning from Jacob, finishing up with him, and then moving into Joseph next. Uh, you know the scriptures very well, you know, you know what's, uh, what's, uh, what's in them and what's coming up next? Um, all right, so we if a person can learn all kinds of great things from the scriptures, and, and and yet it profits them nothing if they haven't learned that which is of utmost importance, which is the uh, what is was the one thing that we must understand out of everything in this book. It's vast. And you can see sometimes just within a few verses, it can stimulate a conversation for hours. Uh, I've read a lot of books in my life, and almost every book I've read, I read it one time, maybe twice is the most, and, and you've got out of it everything you're going to get out of it. But this is a book, really a collection of 66 books, that... I've continued to read now for almost 29 years, and I read it over and over and over, and every time I read it, 
so there's another revelation. You never stop learning. You can never exhaust it. You can never understand it completely. And that's that's the beauty and the exciting thing about studying the scriptures. But but nothing in the scriptures compares to the one thing that we must understand. And that is, after we die, it doesn't end. There is an afterlife. Now, if you're an atheist and you think you just die and it's just, it's just over and you don't exist anymore, then uh, you're going to be in for a big shock. Uh, so the, the actual thing that happens is that we are going to uh, die and then we're going to be judged. And we're not going to be judged uh, to, in order to go to heaven based upon how, how much we strive to climb up that ladder to heaven through by being religious, by being moral, by being upright and doing good things and giving to charity. That's not, that's not the, the kind of work ethic, the uh, merit system. That's not how we get our way to heaven. After we die, if we want to have eternal life in heaven, there's only one way that we can get it. It's not through our own efforts. It's through the efforts and promises of Jesus Christ. So th th this is the difference between all the religions of the world and the gospel that we find in the scriptures. The gospel is just a Greek word that means good news. The good news is, uh, even though you could never work your way to heaven, God wants you to give you eternal life, and so God came to our rescue and said, mankind is helpless in a hopeless situation. He cannot get into heaven because we've all sinned. And we, no matter how much we strive to work our way to heaven, we can never reach the standard that God has set, which is perfection. The example that was given to us that we must reach is Jesus Christ. Perfect, sinless. And no matter how hard we try, we fail. We all fall short. God said, I have to come to their rescue. I have to save them because they cannot do it. Jesus said, when he was asked by his apostles, well, how, if this rich man can't be saved, how is it possible for anyone to be saved? And he said, with man, it is impossible. But with God, it is possible. See, you have to understand that on your own, it is impossible. You cannot strive and get to heaven through your own efforts. So first understand that and then realize that God loves you so much that he wants to rescue us from this futility. And so he, scripture says that God became a man named Jesus Christ. And, and Jesus said he came down from heaven and became a man. And there was one reason to give his life as a ransom. A ransom is a payment made to set us free. Set us free from judgment and condemnation. And so how did Jesus do it? He gave his life on a cross. He was nailed to a cross. He suffered and died on that cross. And the scripture says our sins were all put on him and so that his righteousness could be given to us. And he paid for our sins. So now you don't have to... Uh, worry that because of your sin God won't accept you. Jesus paid for our sins. So sin is not a barrier separating us from God. Now all that God requires of us is one thing, faith in Jesus. The Apostle Paul was asked, what must I do to be saved? That just simply means, what do I have to do? What is required of me so that I can go to heaven? And the Apostle Paul said it succinctly. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Believe on Jesus, and you will have eternal life in heaven. So, <clears throat> Jesus solved our sin problem by dying on the cross. He paid for our sins. And he, he offers us eternal life in heaven as a free gift. If you just believe in him, he gives you eternal life as a free gift. Now, the, the reason we should put our faith in Jesus and, and have confidence that this is all true is because Jesus raised himself from the dead. The Jewish religious leaders, in spite of the fact that Jesus had performed all kinds of miracles, 
they demanded the sign from him. He says, I'll give you only one sign, and that is the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall I be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. He was talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. He said that would be the sign for us so that we can have confidence in putting our faith in him. When Jesus raised himself from the dead, it gives me confidence in saying he's who he said he is. He, he, he does have the power over life and death. And so I am confident that Jesus is able to give me eternal life. I'm confident that he will give it to me because he is faithful. His, the scripture says that he cannot deny himself. He cannot break his promise. So if you want to receive eternal life in heaven, you put your faith in Jesus Christ and he promises you eternal life in heaven. It's that simple. And once you receive this as a gift, you can never lose it for any reason. You don't ever have to worry that somehow if you do something bad, that he's going to take it away. Or somehow if your faith wavers, that somehow he's going to take it away. No, he says he will never leave you or forsake you. So that's good news. That's why it's called the gospel. It's a Greek word that means good news. Brother Sam, uh, I'll let you say goodbye to everybody and any final thing you want to say, and then uh, hopefully I hope you can join me again on next Sunday to discuss this further. Thank you. God bless you all. Um, our hope uh, lies with the uh, spiritual realm, uh, not physical realm, just like um, how Isaac was, uh, although venison is yummy, you know, he was uh, quite into something uh, worldly in, in a way. Uh, we do have our own um, callings and uh, when and how they'll be given uh, in time by God. Um, obviously, we cannot be perfect in any way, but we can be made perfect in Christ and made free in Christ. So if anyone out there uh, you know, who would be saying that uh, you can lose your salvation somehow, uh, don't believe that sort of lie because when you believe on Christ you become a son of God. Um, and once you are a son of God you will always be a son of God. Um, when, how, uh, that will be all given. So uh, keep your faith in Christ and walk the faith in Christ diligently uh, and work out uh, our own salvations with fear and trembling. And, and we should strive to edify and strengthen and comfort uh, each other and as Christ said and commanded us to love one another and um, and constantly seek for the for the kingdom of God and for his righteousness and he did promise all shall be added unto us so you know believe on Christ and have everlasting life God bless you, and have a good one. Thank you, Brother Luke. All right. Uh, Brother Sam, thank you for joining me today. And to all the, the viewing audience, uh, bless you all. In the name of our great Savior God, his name is Jesus Christ.